Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lisa Mo Salvides, and I'm the director of Archipelago, the Island Institute Store and Gallery. As a key component of the Island Institute's small business work, Archipelago supports artists and makers through one-on-one -on -one mentoring, as well as by showcasing them in our Main Street Rockland storefront and online. We're focused on highlighting the vast array of art and products created by all those who are inspired by the beauty and endurance of Maine's islands and coast. Archipelago also produces programming, including videos, trainings, and resources specifically for artists and makers, like this annual conference adapted into a new virtual format this year. Even though we can't see each other in person, we can see each other in our mind's eye and hold space in our hearts until we visit again. Remember, we designed this conference with your input. So as always, reach out with suggestions and feedback. With all of this work, we recognize and value the importance of the creative economy in building a resilient Maine. I'd also like to recognize that as we are gathering from different areas of Maine and perhaps the country, I acknowledge that where I am today in Rockland, I am in the homeland of the Wabanaki people and that the places where we all work, live, and recreate are part of this indigenous land. We're posting a link in the chat to share a native lands map. We encourage you to check out the map and learn more about the native land you occupy. We also invite you to check out the Abbey Museum that offers many excellent exhibitions and program opportunities virtually or in person to learn more about Wabanaki nations. I'd like to thank you and welcome you again for joining this keynote conversation with Gabrielle Melchionda. Welcome, Gab. First, a bit of Zoom housekeeping. Attendees will be on silent mode for the entire virtual event. We'll not be using the chat function today to ask questions, but please chat with the Institute staff if you have a technical issue. If you have a question for Gab, please click on the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, Zoom screen and we'll type it in anytime. We're ending today with 15 minutes of questions and we can't wait to share your questions with Gab. Good morning, Gab. Good morning, Thanks Lisa. for joining us. Thank it's you so for nice having me. You. So glad to be here, thank you. So we'd love to know more about Gab. Walk us through from the beginning, if you would, please. How did you get started? Absolutely. I'm going to do a little show and tell if that's okay. I always am somebody who likes to see pictures and I'm a visual learner. So if you guys will bear with me, I'm going to share a little um, slideshow that I've put together that I think tells the story best. Can everybody see that? Looks great. Looks great. Okay. So um, I always feel like when I am asked to share my story, the most important of any piece of any story is the, the human component, right? So I like to um, sort of set the stage. This is me when I was four. The spaghetti in the middle has been my path. And then on the right is um, a sort of recent picture of where I am today. And I share this because I had never intended, I could have never foreseen that I would do over the last 30 years what I've done because of who I am. And um, I will walk you through who that is a little bit here. So I am from Massachusetts and my father was a physician uh, by trade, but he was an artist um, through his passion. My mother is a French immigrant and I have an older brother who is, um, who I'll talk about a little bit later, but that's us um, back in when I was about two. And then I'll fast forward to here. So I was a kind of kid who was petrified of math and science. I swore as an eight-year-old, I would never have a career that required either. And I continued to struggle with math and science through college and I studied anthropology which seemed like a good, uh, a good career path for somebody who didn't want math or science. I was in cultural anthropology and I also had a side gig working with monkeys. So somewhere in there, I had sort of landed on a, I don't know, a, a future that was unknown. I didn't really have a path. My only career goals when I was in college was to have a career that didn't involve pantyhose, a cubicle and a boss. And that was about as specific as I got. I flunked my math class my freshman year and had to take it again my junior year of college to graduate. So I decided while taking this math class in a three week session, I was gonna do something fun. So I signed up for a weekly workshop that was um, how to 
give basic massage. This was 1991, so it was definitely still very fringe. And I learned quickly I like getting massages. I don't like giving them. And I kind of backed away from the practical side of the workshop. And the teacher brought in uh, books on how to make stuff at home. It was a DIY body care book. And in there was a recipe for lip balm. And I decided to make some. My neighbor had beeswax. And I was trying to make one that wasn't greasy, that wasn't waxy, and that was made with good ingredients. Because at that point, there was really chapstick, Blistex, and Carmex. And um, so I started making it with beeswax from my neighbor and started giving them out to friends. And they said, you know, people would say, can I get another one? My roommate took it. I used it up. It was great. So slowly but surely, I was convinced to start selling them, which I did to, you know, 10 stores. And the one that sold the most was a natural food store. So I started, I got labels. I had to figure out how to, to put on the labels, how to make an invoice. And, you know, it was definitely a learn as you go. It still is operation. And um, this picture I like to share because this sort of embodies um, a point when I think I felt like I was I was tapping into who I was as a person because the resourcefulness that's always required showed its face here. And this is a piece of wood that I got from a coffin factory in my hometown that donated wood. And I worked with an artist who created the leaves into stamps and uh, we got labels made. And this was my first retail display. So I was out of college in about 50 stores and I would travel uh, three nights a week to uh, I waitress three nights a week. And during the week, I would travel to all the health food stores I could find. And this is pre-internet. So I'd use the yellow pages, I'd use maps. And then I'd go home and make it. And this is a great picture showing all the folks who uh, helped me, because obviously, this is not a one woman show, even if it's my name on everything. These are the people who've helped me, um, some of them anyways, over the years. So it's definitely a collective effort. Um, I can't seem to make it move. Hold on. Hold on. Having it okay. So for me, I graduated in '92. By '94, I was still waitressing and trying to figure out what to do with this hobby, which is really what it was. And I happened to meet um, the founder of Stonyfield Yogurt. We met at a conference he was speaking at, and he mentioned he went to Hampshire College. I went up afterwards and introduced myself. My father went to Hampshire College, and he passed away when he was 41. And he was a doctor at the school, and he was very well known by so many people. Doctor Tony is what everyone called him. So. I've spent a lot of my life trying to reconstruct sort of who he was. And so whenever I hear someone who may be cross paths with him, I sort of hone in on him. I hone in on Gary and said, did you know my dad? And he said, oh my gosh, my dad happened to save his life his first day of college. And he took me in and said, you know, what are you doing with this lip balm? And he became one of my mentors. And through him, I met um, a bunch of people. I worked at a nonprofit in San Francisco. He referred me to, it was started by Anita Roddick from the body shop in Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's. And it was a membership organization for socially responsible CEOs. And this is 1996. So a lot of these names are household now, like seventh generation, Whole Foods, you know, et cetera. But back then they were emerging, right? So I would type in, I do all the admin, we put on these conferences and it was great. I got to see business in earnest uh, by people who felt like, who were doing businesses that were more than just business to me. They were people who valued, um, you know, flexible work schedules, they did employee stock options, they had nursing rooms, they were trying to do things that seemed less, in my mind, capitalistic. And I was, you know, 23, and like, business is bad. And these people made me feel like business could be good. And I was starting to sort of see the wheels churning in my head. And one of the members took me aside and had asked me about Mad Gabs and said, you know, you've got a great product, a lot of energy, but you don't seem like you got the business side squared away. And so he eventually invited me to this incubator, which that's a picture of me with the fellow incubatees in 1996. And it was basically a crash course in business. And I learned the accounting. I learned, you know, sort of the structure. I had to get a, a business plan together, strategic plan and financial projections. So it really solidified, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump in, you know, with both feet. Um, so that was 96. This is my first display that sort of evolved from the prior one, my first trade show booth. My first space, I moved to Portland September 1st, 1996, and this was half a uh, making area and the other half was my office and I rode my bike to work and I made lip balm and shipped it and got on the road. It was definitely a um, very you know small operation. And then over the years, obviously things morphed. We worked with um, community partners and creative work systems for years. I felt really um, strongly about making work for folks in every corner that I could. And these were folks with developmental and physical uh, challenges. So we had them doing a lot of our finishing work on the products. Uh, 1997, I was discovered in Maine by QVC, the home shopping channel of all things. I was only selling in health food stores. So this was a huge departure, um, but they came to Maine looking for 20 companies to promote on the air and I got picked. And in four minutes, I sold more than I'd sold the whole year prior. So that was definitely my first big break. And I had to borrow money for the first time. I got my first loan from Coastal Enterprises and I had to, I hired my first employee. So it's really when it shifted from part-time 
to being uh, a full-time and you know sort of big deal in my mind like okay I can actually do this I got my first award as a young entrepreneur that year and then we um 1998 with the money from QVC I discovered shea butter well, I didn't discover it I found it somebody else obviously discovered it but shea butter was like this nut butter from Africa that I had never heard of and so we put it in the salve I always liked salves but they were too greasy so came up with this product called the elephant loop because I thought it was a fun name and then I sent 80 purple envelopes to beauty editors all over the country and of those 80 the first one that called was Vogue and then L and 17 and over 30 put the products in in that one year so 1998 was this massive explosion of oh my gosh I didn't have a website I didn't take credit cards I had only one phone line and it just really uh we, I called it the oh shit years because every day we're like oh shit what do we need to do today how are we going to figure that out so it was very exciting I also happened to get married that year so that was also exciting um but very overwhelming uh this was a great article and Business Week, and this is the trade show uh, booth evolving, as you can see. We had the Elephant Lube and the Lip Lube uh, with a few other products. And you'll see through the course of the slideshow how the branding has changed in some ways and stayed the same in other ways. But we're always trying to make a bigger splash with very few things. So here we did it with repetition. And here was a really lovely um, photo shoot. We changed the packaging here. And this is where I, I like to talk about game changers. So these are my two game changers, Silas and Jasper. Silas was born in 2000 and Jasper in 2004. So for me, that became a real shift. We had been growing like crazy. That's my, my, my staff and some folks from community partners over the years. And it was really when I had to check myself of, you know, who do I wanna be? What's important in my life? And how am I gonna proceed with this business in a meaningful way that also um, protects the things that are important to me? So um, this is very important, my game changers. and. Um, right around the time Jasper was born, I made, I think, one of our, my biggest mistakes, which we'll talk a little bit more later, but we changed our packaging and rebranded, and we just, it did not work. Nobody recognized this. Nobody knew it was us. People said we were trying to be fresh Samanthas. I mean, it was just, it was really quite bad. We had to take back a lot of return product. It was, um, it was not great, and I'll talk more about, you know, the whys and the what's of that one, but um, it was it was a departure from who we were and the energy was not there. And um, it's pretty, but it, it, it wasn't us. So we'll get back to that. And then this is sort of, I'll stop for a moment and just explain sort of the evolution. How are we doing on time, Lisa? Are we doing okay? You're doing great. So in 2000, um, so we got into all these stores, right? We went into QVC, we got out of just natural foods and we got, into um, more like gifty stores because we started showing at these gift shows in New York. And so we were in college stores, beauty stores and regular old you know, everyday gift shops. And we started getting sales reps around the country in this gift industry, which was new to us because I'd only sold in health food stores. And we had this rep group in Alaska that said, can you put a mousse on your lip balm? And I thought, well, all right. So we put a mousse on it. And I thought, wow, I bet I could sell that in Maine. And so we started selling the mousse smooch. So that was in 2000. In 2004, we went to that through that rebrand. And the only thing I told the folks who helped us with the rebrand is don't touch the mousse, we're gonna fix the rest of the stuff. So we fixed the rest of the stuff and it failed miserably. So at the end, I thought, what are we gonna do? Let's go back to what's working, it's the mousse. So we basically took the mousse back to center stage and we started looking at where the mousse was selling well and what else could we do? So we started selling in Alaska and Colorado and Canada in New England and Minnesota, any place that was sort of mousse friendly. And we became, sort of this um, go-to in the souvenir world, which is funny because I always thought of souvenirs as like hats and keychains and sweatshirts. And all of a sudden people were saying, this is made in the USA, it's natural and organic, and it's something people will use like in their pocket every day. This is great. You know, can we get more of this? Can we have bears? Can we have elephants? Can we have, you know, zebras, giraffes? So we um, blew out the souvenir world and we were in zoos, aquariums, airports, wildlife parks, national parks, state parks, you were, anywhere you'd stop on a, on a road trip or a vacation, that's where we were. So people were finding us all over the country. So for about 10 years, that's really where we grew and um, really expanded and, and became nationwide in a big way. We've been in all the Whole Foods, we've done all this other stuff, but for some reason, these products in this industry really worked. And then around 2014, 15, we started to realize that all the people reaching out to us were saying, hey, I bought your products on vacation. They're great. Where can I get them where I live? And we were like, oh, no, that's not how this works. And, you know, you have to buy them on vacation. And so we couldn't close the cycle for people to become like daily users of Mad Gabs. And even though I'm a huge proponent of not being addicted to lip balm, um, I feel very strongly about that. I did realize that we were missing a lot of opportunity to be their favorite lip balm all year long. And so we made the website, you know, a place people could buy it, which is great, but we weren't um, top of mind. So around 2015, we're like, you know what, we need to clean things up. 
and focus on how to get these products into the stores. This is crazy. This is how you see the non-business side of my brain. Where people buy lip balm, 93% of lip balm is bought in a grocery store, a drugstore, or a pharmacy. It's not where we were selling it. So like we have to fix that if we want to really um, see Mad Gabs to its full potential. So we decided to, to clean up a lot of things that were made just for the gift industry. And I have a few slides here that show you um, a couple of stuff. So on the left here, you see the MG line, which a lot of people don't even know is us. That was our answer to, yeah, I live in Maine. I don't need a lip balm with a moose in it. Um, so we created an everyday line. It's called MG. It celebrated 25 years in business, which was a huge accomplishment. Um, not that we say it anywhere on there, but for me, I was like, okay, we're putting our mark on 25 years. We're going to have this line. This line's like in Hannaford. It's in um, grocery stores. That's basically the everyday line that's there. And then the Mad Gabs was on the right. So it had become kind of a circus. Um, oh, and this is just me chatting with governors in different places. And um, I just told you about this. So it had become a circus. If you look on the left, it was a lot of animals, really fun, really playful, but it wasn't um, a packaged product that we could put into stores in a bigger way. So we changed our displays from wood and gift store friendly to sort of more, um, more everyday friendly. I really love the wooden ones, but it didn't work for what we were trying to do. Our trade show booth, um, you can see it morphing over the years. My least favorite of all of them was this brick business down at the bottom, but I have to include it just to remind myself of the evolution. Um, and I know we're going to talk more about different pieces, but um, I feel like when I, when I, when I look at the evolution of the company and where we are now, which is mostly in gift stores, but also in grocery stores. So we're finding that line to, to toggle. Um, you know, my job now is math and science, which is kind of funny because I definitely shied away from that. And I, it does have a lot of creative elements to it. It does have, there's a lot of stress involved, but it's, it's being who I am and I get to bring myself to work every day. So through 30 years, we just had our 30 year anniversary. Um, I definitely feel really proud of the fact that I've been able to find places for where my gifts serve Mad Gabs and also serve me. And I think balancing that little girl who was at the beginning in her winding kooky path to where we are now, I mean, it's a small business. It's not some you know big, huge enterprise. So it's always changing. Um, and along with that, I'm obviously always changing and I'm having to constantly um, to morph as we go. But I am, uh, I'm really proud of where we are now. And I feel really um, good about the space I'm at. I just turned 50 last month and I feel like that was such an honor and a gift and to be able to have had 30 years of, um, of improvising and being an entrepreneur has been uh, a, a true pleasure. And obviously not just me, there's a lot of people that have made this happen, but I'm, um, I'm, I'm excited for the rest of this conversation. As far as the story goes, I'm going to stop there and um, we can jump into the rest. Does that work, Lisa? That's great, Gab. Thanks for that introduction. Absolutely. So I know that you've talked a lot there in the slideshow and I've heard you talk about the rebranding. Mm -hmm. How do you make big decisions like that? What are your um, some of your key successes and failures? And really tell me a little bit about your decision-making process. Absolutely. Um, I think it, I, I'm getting better as I get older. I'll definitely give myself some credit for that. I'm a very, I'm a collaborative person. I don't make any decisions in a vacuum. And I think over the years I've done, I've asked for too much input sometimes when it hasn't been helpful. And other times I've um, just sort of run with an idea and not checked with anybody. So I think for me, it's finding that balance, that rebrand that we did. Um, I, I think the biggest takeaway for me on that one was I didn't trust the, the message inside me, the, the, the gut. The gut check didn't work. And I was, you know, I was having a my second child. I had a very busy four-year-old in the middle of a renovation. I was very flooded with a lot of responsibility and a lot of balls, very little sleep. So I didn't trust myself to trust my gut. So I doubted the process by which all the good stuff had happened. You know, moose smooch naming that was just something I was sitting in a wagon, like we have to have a good name for this lip balm. It has to be moose something, like oh moose smooch. Oh, there it is. Like the things for me that just pop out tend to be the most in the vibe and they really do capture it. The things that are too contrived, you know, I really want to honor that spontaneity, that good yeah. idea. But a lot of the world doesn't, doesn't really support that. They want you to, you know, plan this and plot this. And you do need it for things like business plans. You do need it for financial planning, right? But the creative side doesn't always fit into that. So I mean, I've had times when I've asked everybody on staff, you know, for an opinion and not been able to make a decision until everybody agreed. And that's so painful, right? So I think I'm at a place now where I know 
okay, yeah, I don't need anybody's opinion on this, or I'm going to check with this person, but not six people. So it's really weighing in how much outside input to have and how to balance that with the gut. And I have great advisors. I have so many amazing people who make themselves available to me for conversations and I have them for, for different things. And I feel really blessed because I think that that's so important, right? Your support network, whatever that looks like. And that's one thing I noticed that I hadn't heard you talk about is your early mentoring um, and the incubator program and mentoring I'm imagining with Gary Hirschberg. And can you tell us a little bit about that role um, of a mentor and support system plays for you? Yeah, I, I think I was, I'm so grateful that my mentors have stuck with me because I'm, I can be very um, thick headed to hearing things. I do, um, Joe, my, my mentor who had the incubator, I mean, he came to me and this was one of my favorite stories and he knew I'm a French Italian. I was giving dinner parties when I was 19 in college, making homemade tortillas or homemade fresh pasta and cooking for people. So he knew that cooking was in my blood. And he listened to me talk about Mad Gaps for, you know, weeks I was at the incubator and he said to me, you like to have dinner. What do you do when you have a dinner party? And I said, oh, well, you make the pasta and you do this. No, 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 way before that. And I was like, I don't know. And he said, you make a menu, you clean your house, you get to go to the grocery store, you know? And he said to me, your business is like a meal. He said, you're in your robe and your guests are on the porch and you don't know what's for dinner. And I was, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I'm working so hard. He said, I'm not saying you're not working. You don't have a balance sheet. You don't have your accounting in order. Yeah, you can sell lip balm all days long, but we don't know the status of your business without this. So we kept going back to that dinner party analogy. And I'd say, we're toasting, because that was like the pinnacle. When everybody's toasting with their glass, you know you're, you're done, you've made it, right? Mm -hmm. I'd say, we're toasting. He'd say, nah, you've got your menu. Ah, you might've gone shopping. So for years, we would go back to that analogy. And it was so helpful because it was a language I spoke. And I'd say, okay, what do I need to do? Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, it was key. And like Gary would say, you know, your profit and loss, and he'd draw it on a legal pad. And I'd say, ah, I'm not interested in that. He'd say, this is a business. If it's not a business, don't do it. You know, get a job, do this on the side. But if this is a business, these are things you have to learn. And I, I didn't write a business plan for six years. Like that's, that's just, that's not smart, right? Like it's, I say to people, it's like having a baby and painting the nursery while you're holding your baby instead of painting the nursery like two months in when you're pregnant, right? So that it's done ahead of time. Like it's just much, you can do it, but it's much easier the other way. So I think getting out of my own way has been a, a process and my mentors have been so patient with me, um, trying really hard to just button my, my big mouth sometimes and just let the information come to me and take it in. <laughs> I'm curious, Gab, um, wanted to know a little bit more about how you develop yourself, your skills, um, nurtured your whole self as the founder of owner of a successful company? Well, it really depends on the decade, right? I've done this in my <laughs> teens, my twenties, my thirties, my forties. Now I'm going into my fifties. And I think, um, I think part of it, and I'm, I'm thinking too about the folks who are, who are here sort of listening to this. And I, I feel like everyone has a creative side, right? Even if they don't, pay attention to it or don't identify as a creative. And I watched my father when I was little and he died when I was 12. So this is going way back, but he would have been an artist if he was allowed to. He had to be a doctor because his parents told him that, that was, he was gonna be a priest and then he left the, the seminary and they said, okay, if you're not gonna be a priest, you're gonna be a doctor. So he was a lovely, he was an amazing physician. He was very bright, but he wove tapestries. He wrote poetry. He wrote short stories. He was an amazing, he was, a, he, he was amazing, yeah. but he, was a Renaissance man. He was an artist. So I would watch him weave on the weekends with his big earphones and, you know, or playing Gregorian chants really loudly. And I watched sort of who he was at work and who he was at home. And somehow I think they fed each other. He loved people. He loved the relationships that being a doctor gave him. So I was thinking about it last night and thinking, because sometimes I forget that there's a whole creative side to what I do, because so much of what I do is not creative, right? But finding ways to bring the creativity into the work for me is really important because I think that little girl on the left is a writer, is a storyteller, is a performer. And I've never been able to give as much attention to those parts of me, but I find ways to be a storyteller within that gap. This is a storytelling moment, right? This is a conversation that's, um, that's about a story. And I love other people's stories. I certainly um, love to hear other people talk more than me, but I'm happy to, to share because I like it to be mutual. So for as far as like how to balance it, it's like right now it's about doing yoga, getting good sleep. It's about making sure that I'm whole, that whole oxygen mask for you first before you can be there for anybody else. Um, 
And at moments, it's just doing the best I can. When I was sleep deprived and had the kids at work with me and just trying to make do, I, I had to lower my expectations or change them and get help, right? I'm big at asking for help when I need it. And I'm not afraid to help anybody. I'm also not afraid to ask for help, which I do on the regular. So um, it really, it's something that never is done, right? It's 30 more years is what they say in, in <laughs> Buddhism, right? 30 more years, 30 more years. So it's it's a challenge like it is for anyone, right? But for me, I have to find spaces for the creative side and the quiet side because I run really hot. So being still, and I have to say in the last year, I've never been this still, I've never been this quiet, I've never been this much at home. I've always traveled constantly. So this has been a year of metamorphosis for who I am and for how I bring myself to my work and my life. And um, it's just getting better. So I think my processes after 30 years are, get, are improving, which is really nice. So um, yeah, work in progress always. Well, I heard you mention writing and inspiration and I know that you um, pursue that every day. So how do you find inspiration for Gab every day? I don't write every day all the time. And I haven't written for a little while. I wrote more in April, May, June, and July last year than I've probably written in my life combined. I had it just, I wrote my book, which I've been writing in my head and pieces here and there. Um, and that was just time. It just had to come out. So I have most of the book written. And of course I want to write it again, but those early morning hours, for yoga and writing are like the perfect time for me. And um, I also am a summer person. I, in the winter, I tend to go inward and I'm cold, I'm always cold. So for me that summer, those summer months when the sun is up and the birds are out and I can sit at my computer and just pick away at it are amazing. I like workshops too. I really like the work, the writing workshops I've done with other people. I, I love community and there's a lot of insular pieces to being a small business owner like this. The trade shows are great. You know, when we had them, we don't have them anymore. The The store calls were lovely. You get to meet people, but I don't go on the road anymore. So for me, I have to really find space to um, connect with that creative side of me. I did a, um, um, a storytelling sound bites I did a couple years ago, and that was my first true storytelling in public. And that was really lovely. And I'd love to do more of that. But it's, um, it's yeah, yoga, writing and self-care and sleeping are all um, really important. And I would like to do a residency. That's my goal for 22 is to have to really carve out some sacred time to get away and just write um, and not have the cooking and the friends and the you know distractions there. But I do think for me that the, the COVID quiet, the quiet of COVID helped give me a space for creativity like nothing I've ever seen before. So I was grateful for for the the changes in my life and the create the home the space for creativity that it gave me i've never seen anything like that and it was inspiring mm -hmm. wow that's something i really got to get back to so great thank you i know that you've been um mentoring yourself as well through a program called gab girls can you tell us a little bit about this program and um how you think about community impact and its relationship to your business model Mm, my business model, I guess the first thing I'll say is that I feel like my business model is more of a Mad Gab's mentality because I've always prided myself on not being like a real business person. Like I'm not really a grown up, even though I am and I have all the traffics <laughs> of that. Like, yes, I have a business, but it's a it's a it's a mentality, right? And people who come into our web know that. And the Gab Girls has been an evolution since I was <laughs> I was there. I learned how to be a business person because countless people over the years helped school me, right? Like I went into a health food store in Oakland, California, and they said, where do you get your ingredients? I said, oh, at Bread and Circus. And they said, you buy them retail? And I said, well, how else would I get them? And they said, wholesale. And I said, what is that? They said, it's half of the price of retail. I said, how do I do that, right? <laughs> so that person told me how to buy wholesale. Somebody else explained, you know, what net 30 terms were. So, and between Joe and Gary and the store owners who took me in, everybody, you know, educates educated me as I went and I'm I would never have learned those things so and little by little because lip balm is just an organic no pun intended magnet for young women and girls like girls love lip balm you have a store buyer who's got a 12 year old daughter she's like lurking it's like wait hold on you're talking about lip balm like they just they come in so they've been showing up since 1996 I mean since we were in Portland we had a Wayne Fleet High Schooler say can I volunteer I said sure 
she came and volunteered. She's now one of my mentors. She's now 37 and she's helping me with some of my, my other, my speaking engagements and things like that, that she's learned how to do, but she's the original gal girl. And we've had employees, we've had people that do apprenticeships, internships, worked with um, St. Joe's and USM law students have filed our trademarks, like everywhere we can connect <laughs> community and we don't always say like do you have any young women students but it's always young women. we've had a couple of guys but they don't their their attachment to what we do is just different it's a very feminine vibe the mad gabs thing so in 2017 people kept saying you spend all this time with these you know these kids these other these students you know you should put put a name on it tell people about it i said no i don't need to tell anybody this is just something that that i enjoy doing and they said yeah but people will want to support your brand if they know the good you're doing so it was just like getting an organic seal i don't need someone on the outside to tell me our products are organic but you don't know they're organic unless you see that seal so i'm starting to come around to some of the conventional ways of identifying and having a name for gab girls has given us a platform to talk about it and now when i go call on a buyer and they'll say tell us about what you're doing with the girls so it's been great and before COVID it was workshops that we'd do these two-hour workshops in person where we'd have the girls come in I'd tell them the story they'd each design their own lip balm company they'd break out into groups they'd come back and they'd present it and they'd practice pitching a la Shark Tank so they'd do their little spiel, spiel for everybody they'd give each other feedback we'd work on the feedback model then they'd all make lip balm and they'd go home and it was super fun um, so we did that a number of times in um, 18 and 19. And then in 20, obviously we were like, wah, wah, wah. okay, we can't do that anymore. So we started doing, we did an online Zoom called Now What for emerging young women who sort of had the life rug pulled out from them. And we had college and high school women having these amazing online chats, which were really, really amazing. And then now we're doing um, something I'm super excited about called Incubating Innovators. We've been meeting since December and I have three groups of young women, 11 to 14, who have designed a product company and we're taking the products from idea to market. And in June, they'll be at the Yarmouth Farmers Market selling. Oh, their wow. It's really the, the latest and great. And that's all been on Zoom and it's been great and super, super fun. And it reminds me of, I mean, I'm, it's a pilot program. I'm learning how to help them and teach them as much as they're learning how to do stuff. So it's been really exciting and that's part of how I stay really inspired, right? Watching these, one of them is a, a couple of sisters who make body care and they're doing a great job. And it's so, so fun to do that. It feels very meaningful, right? It takes all the stuff that people have helped me learn and help me um, plant little seeds with them. And if it resonates and they go into business, great. If they don't, they're still getting skills that are useful. So it's become a really important part of, of what Mad Gabs is. So did you say June at the Yarmouth Farmer's Market? Okay, that's exciting. How, how many um, young women are in that program? Um, there's three groups. So there's three, six, eight. Yep, three That's businesses. Crazy. We've got a body care business, a candle business, and a doggy biscuit um, company. Ah, uh, yeah, excellent. Fun. So I just want to remind the audience to put um, Q&A questions for Gab in the Q&A section. Um, we'd love to um, hear what you have to say for Gab. Um, and Gab, I'm wondering, I heard a little bit about your mentors. I'm wondering who inspires you. Um, is there someone that you look to when you're trying to find inspiration to make a decision or to try something new or to move forward in a different direction? You know, God, there's probably so many. The ones I think of off the top of my head are all writers. And I think for me, the inspiration for writing and the reading is what fuels me. And for whatever it's worth, it helps me in my professional life. Right now, I just got Aaron French's book, The Lost Kitchen. Um, uh -huh. that, that just arrived last night, so I'm so excited. Um, Gabrielle Hamilton, who wrote Blood, Bones, and Butter, she has a restaurant in New York called Prune. And she wrote, a, she writes for the New York Times quite a bit. And she wrote an article about closing down during COVID. And then there's, there's one part where she's on her belly in her kitchen in prune which i've eaten at once and she's scraping the grease from underneath the grill thinking about am i ever going to have this restaurant again what's going to happen like the world has come to a screeching halt and i would never have time to scrape the grease from under the grill right she'd been doing that business for a long time and for me reading that article and just listening to someone who who is a creative who is a business owner who creates with food and creates community around food um i think we all for me, I feel like that's my mad gabs, right? Like that's the people that I've worked with, the, 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 the connections with the people that, you know, may have a link to us somewhere or the artist who helps us design the labels. I mean, there's just so many ways that those things that get my attention weave into what, what I do. Um, and for me saying connected to words and stories is paramount. And I, I just, 
three three memoirs came up to me yesterday, and I just feel like the the idea of capturing the story and the meaning of um, who the human is, because that's all that comes out, right? Like we want to know where our things come from, who's behind it. We want to we do vote with our dollars, and we do choose which you know milk we buy, which lip balm we buy, and I am of the mindset that if it can have a human component that makes you feel connected and it has to be able to work well and, and you know, do its job, right? And for me, it's always, is it is it not greasy or waxy? These are the three things I need. It has to be not greasy or waxy, not made with junky ingredients, and it couldn't be overly scented. I didn't want a lip balm that you could smell from 20 feet away. When I was eight, I wanted this. I wanted strawberry you could smell a mile away, but like, <laughs> You know, so if we can make good products and we can tell good stories, connect them with other people and package them in a way that says, hello, we're a different lip balm. We don't look like anybody else. And there's a reason why. And then people sort of come into our web and we keep them, you know, that's kind of how I look at it. So inspiration is, I mean, it can be, it could be anything, but at the moment it's, it's a lot of writers. It's often been writers, um, but not directly, not in a way that it's like, if I'm thinking about packaging, do I go to this person? And I, I don't really, I do a lot from like, just you know, I sort of scribble things down. I send them to Walt, who's my designer, and he reads my brain. And then he says like this, like this. And I say, I'm, I, you can't even tell if I try to draw a moose. No one even knows what it is. It sticks with like things coming out. I can't draw to save my life. I can describe it really well. And he speaks the, the, the language in my brain. So I think it's, it's always collaborative, right? Of where, where the pieces come together, but I don't really have specific inspiration that I get other than just the creative people. Well, I think it's interesting that you pick memoirs and, and th pieces like that, because it seems like you really are looking for other humans' paths and how other humans do what we do and how we make it through and how we adapt and how we grow and how we build community. So that's really, I love hearing about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, wondering about... Um, how your leadership style has evolved over time. And um, if you would talk a little bit about that, you, you mentioned the balance between asking everyone and not being able to make a decision and kind of like then maybe um, having a lot of ideas and moving forward without too much input. So how do you, how do you find that balance for yourself? It's gotten much easier. I think I trust myself to, to know a little bit more now. And I, I think... Um because I have sort of certain people that I go to for different things and I don't have as many people, we really streamlined sort of the day-to-day -day operations. And in the last year we've become very virtual, right? So we're not all working together side by side every day. So um, I, it's helped me connect with different people, not at Mad Gabs more regularly, which has been really helpful and learn how other people work with their staff and their crew. And I always think of it as, as a team. I, I, I don't always think of myself as a leader necessarily because I know in, theory I am and I recognize that I'm responsible in in that way but I um I guess I'm much I think of myself more as a collaborator but I I own the responsibilities that come along with that so um yeah I, I'm I love that <laughs> idea of incorporating the collaborator in with what we think of as a leader because I think we're just beginning to break that apart about what it means to be a leader so I love that that aspect that you bring into it. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Lil is wondering um, who helped you pull together your business plan and was there a person or organization in particular that helped guide you? Yes, yes, and so many. Um, <laughs> I've worked with the Small Business Development Corporation. I've worked with SCORE. I've worked with CEI Women's Business Center. I've worked with, um, so many. The first one I did was with Joe in the incubator. And then I, I still have this outline. It was a paper outline from the Small Business Development Corporation in Springfield, Massachusetts. I have it in my file. I actually scanned it in recently because it's the, the most direct outline for a business plan. I've gone online. They have like 200 page outlines that just seem <laughs> so excessive for so many businesses. I mean, you just want to get the, the core down, right? So that has been most helpful. And I go back to that when I need to look at sort of where we're going next. And I'll say, check yourself, go back to look at these. I write a business plan every couple of years because I have to, right? To stay in moving forward a bit. But um, those there are so many organizations and Maine is ripping with people that want to help small businesses. And um, 
you know, like I said, CEI score has, our score office in Portland was the national, um, the award of the first prize in all the scores in the country last year or the year before. Um, really amazing people who can help with that. And I, I think that a business plan sounds so boring and it sounds so blah, but it, it, Joe always described it as the spinal cord of your enterprise. And without it, everything kind of is jelly. So I, I think if, if, for me, being somebody who likes to write creatively, but doesn't, didn't always value a business plan, it's an exercise. It's an exercise to check how it works on paper so you can make it work in real life. So it's basically like your marching orders, but you put them together. So um, yeah, Maine is, is so full of so many great resources that I've used as well as Massachusetts and California, but there, there's tons out there to, to use them to find great, them. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Shelly brings up a comment that I'm, I'm thinking about as well. She says, um, I first brought your product standing in line in People's Market. Your staying oh. power is so inspirational. So talk a little bit about your success um, through longevity. What, what do you think the factors are that, that fuels that longevity? I love that. People's Market was the first store to sell Mad Gabs. They're at UMass. That's my alma mater where I studied anthropology. So that very close to home. Um, I'm not sure if it's still there. Someone said to me last week, 30 years, man, you've been doing this a long time. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm going to say I'm very, very stubborn. And I'm really, um, I, when I decide something, I, I typically just keep going. So there's that perseverance piece that giving up was never an option, but that doesn't mean that there aren't many times that I think I'm crazy. Why am I still doing this? Right? So I think it's important for everybody to know that no matter how long you've been doing it, everybody has those days where you think this is nuts, you know, and it is a weird bubble to be in a business like this for so long. I mean, I always say I've never had a real job. People say, you have so many jobs. I'm like, I know, but I've never like filled out a job application or like done an interview. And, you know, there's so many things I haven't experienced doing this, but so many that I have that I know a lot of people don't have the, um, the, the ability to do. So it's a luxury, I think. And a lot of people have made this possible for me. I think a lot of my mom supported me for the whole year I was in the incubator. She said, let's pretend you're in grad school. You can live at home, live minimally. I'll feed you, you know, and I've always been somebody who lives very minimally. So I've been able to make it work. And, um, but it, it's, it's not like it just works. You know, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. And not that I'm trying to like say I'm such a martyr because I've made those choices. And part of the choices I've made were to be a mother primarily for when my kids were little. I mean, I was there for the school bus every day, for every sick day, for vacations, for everything. So yeah. a lot of my business didn't develop in those years because I chose to be mom. Yeah. And I'll never regret that. I have two amazing kids and, um, you know, who regrets doing that? Nobody. So do I miss the business opportunities? No. Do I, am I aware of them? Absolutely. So I've, my goal was, and this is what my mother-in-law told me. She said, she is an artist. And she said, when her kids were little, she would, she would take every moment. There's a great picture of one of her kids sleeping face down with his fingers in his mouth that she drew in a red pen. And she showed it to us. And she said, you know, having five children is a very busy thing, but if you can keep your creative side going and alive, and she was always encouraging me to write, you know, eventually there's time in life to do those things. So my goal with Mad Gabs was, okay, if I can keep this thing going and make it sustainable while my kids are little, when they're bigger, I can put more energy into it. So now my kids are 21 and 17. And the last two years, I've been able to spend a lot of time really looking at what I want the business to be and what I want to do with my life and where my creativity is going to play in. So I've had a lot of um, great support like that. And those words from work from moms who've had to make space for mothering because that's the hardest challenge of all was balancing that and doing both of those things at the same time and thinking I could do everything really well but yeah I suffered and I'm okay with that because in the end the things that matter um have been intact and and really healthy so I'm grateful for that and for having good role models of working moms to to, yeah. to follow and to encourage me so that really resonates with me too Gab not being able to do all the things at the same time that you want to have in your life but spacing them out and of course for me also giving my mothering attention and yeah I love hearing that thank you um if you would say something to your younger self what do you think that something would be or what would that conversation be like oh, I wouldn't my younger self wouldn't have listened <laughs> so stubborn um if I could talk to her, though, and maybe duct tape her mouth shut for a little while, I would tell her to get to ask for help 
especially when the kids are little more and mm -hmm. to be okay with that. I wanted to be and do everything myself. Um, I also would probably have connected with somebody to have a partner earlier on so that I could focus on the kids and let the business go. There's sort of a life cycle, I think, to business. And I think you get these sort of waves and some of them, I, I know somebody with a more business mindset could have done more with that side. So that would have been probably a smarter thing for me to explore when I was younger, but I, I wouldn't have. Um, mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, doing thinking forward earlier. I really was in the moment and you know that book, The Tao of Pooh? they take all the Winnie the Pooh characters. I was very yeah, yeah. much Pooh when I was much younger. And then I became rabbit and just kind of <laughs> fast, 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 you know, because I had so many things to do all the time. And I've gone, I feel like I'm going back to my my Pooh place now because I can, right? It's hard to do that when you have little people and you know who need you all the time. Um, but I would I would ask her to to stop and to be still because I think that was mm -hmm. something how I needed it. And I, and you only can hear what you can hear at the time, right? But so remember to put your questions in the chat for Gab. Um, wondering this, this is a little bit of a surprise question, um, oh. but I've, I've heard you talk about imposter syndrome in some of our other um, conversations. And it's something I've been thinking about. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you experience that dynamic and and what you do with that and what it how it shows up? I loved when I first heard about that because I thought, oh, there's a name for this. Other people feel this too. I think it's really easy to think that we're alone in that feeling of, you know, who said who said uh, I could do this? Who thinks that I know this? And honestly, even having these conversations today, there's still a part of me that goes, does anybody really want to listen to me talk about, you know, this lip balm thing I've been doing for 30 years? Like, who am I to be showing it to talking to, you know, to anybody about anything? But at the same token, I love when other people share stories. So I know there's value in every story. It's just sometimes um, as much as I'm a talker, being somebody, expecting that there's something of value in the story you tell is feels like there's a little bit of that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an artist, but I don't live as an artist. I have a creative side, but I don't have a lot of space. Or I haven't made enough space for that in my professional life. So I, I think the imposter, it's like a whack-a-mole, you know, and you have to check it. But <laughs> is, I think of it as an opportunity to say, am I being true to my authentic self? Am I doing the things that really do feed who I am? And I should, I should, and I will write more and I will do, I will pursue my creative side of my life more because that feels like that little girl with the spaghetti path, you know, that's, that, that, that's there. But I also do own that everybody has, has a path professional or creative that is worth sharing. So I try to remember that and think, um, you know, I heard Doug Levin, who was the, the founder of Fresh Samantha's, the juice company years ago, 1985, I was in Portland and he stood up and he had a shop and save receipt with a bunch of things written on it and his pants he looked like he just rolled out of bed and i his story was so amazing to me and it was about the chaos of the fruit in the basement and the machines and the leaking and the just the everything and i thought if anybody ever asks me to tell my story which of course i i didn't think that would happen i thought i want to sound like that guy he just was so engaging because he didn't have anything written down and he was just so um unassuming about all of it so i thought well he you know, he doesn't, maybe the imposter syndrome is something that, that is prevalent in men. I only talk to women about it, but I feel like mm -hmm. that idea of coming out of the bubble that we live in where everything makes sense and coming out and thinking it's going to make sense to anybody else, just inevitably, you know, like who's an expert on what? It, it's all relative, right? Like mm -hmm. Dr. Fauci is an expert. I don't think he ever, maybe he has an imposter syndrome. I don't know, but it's, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, I think it gets easier as time goes on and as you say to yourself, well, everybody has a part of them that feels that way. Natalie Goldberg, the writer says, that she calls it monkey mind. You know, everybody says, well, who am I to be saying any of these things? Well, put that away and keep going anyways. And then you just get stronger and stronger and the voice gets quieter and yeah. quieter, but it doesn't go away. Yeah. Um, Jen was asking, Genevieve was wondering, is Gab gonna tell us something about her brother? Because you did mention that oh, and we have yes. to cycle back to that story. Yeah. So. Uh, this will age me a bit, but there was a show called Family Family Ties. Family Ties. Back yeah. In the 80s. With and Alex Keaton and Alex P. Keaton. That was my brother. My brother was Alex <laughs> P. Keaton. 
He framed money above his bed and he had cars, posters in his room. He wanted to, you know, we, we were raised very bohemian. My parents' headboard was a piece of plywood with furry fabric stapled to it, you know, records, tapestries, looms, you know, and they were just, that was the time, that was who they were. Definitely, you know, we'd go to Europe, but we'd like sleep on people's floors and stuff. It was fun. It was a, definitely a very bohemian um, upbringing for him. That made him want to have a very different life as an adult. And he was really motivated by creating an empire. And um, I was, he kept saying, you're going to have to sell this stuff. And I thought, I don't want to sell this stuff. Why would I sell lip balm? He said, because you can make money. I was like, that's not very interesting. And so he was like, <laughs> you know, he beat his head in that 20, he just reminded me of this when I was, I think 24, he came to me and said, why don't I do this with you? And I was like, absolutely not. I totally forgot. He's probably the person I should have had that conversation with a long time ago, right? To do it while I was having my kids. But he, um, he went on to get everything he wanted and then some, and he really was focused on the, the eye, he had his eye on the prize and that's who he is and that's how he works. And I have had that spaghetti path and I was never terribly motivated by building an empire. It was more about the experiences and the relationships which mattered to me. So, you know, I, 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 I love how we were, rate, were 11 months apart. We were raised in the same house from the same recipe, same oven, same cook time, very different cookies, like mm. a lot of people describe their kids. And um, he's been helping me with my business for the last handful of years and really giving me insight and helping me see sort of how to pull it down the road in a way. So that that picture of us when we're little and I think about who we were as kids and when I started this and he was kind of mad at me because he always wanted a business and I didn't want one and I ended up with one. He's like, well, how did this happen? You know? So it was um, it was funny, but in the end, I think we both see a lot of value in what the other has done. And we come to the table with our respective you know, piles of information, our little baskets of life. And then we, we take everything out and look at it together. And it's pretty cool, you know, now 50 mm. ish and he's 51 and be able to look That's at really it special. And reflect on that. So yeah. That's really nice. Okay. So we have a question from Janet. She says, I'm on the opposite end. I started my business six years ago at 60. And when I got laid off, I'm struggling right now with my last year, my online business tripled because consumers wanted to support small businesses. This spring, they want sales, so it's hard to stay motivated. And I think the question that she's wondering about is how do you stay motivated during challenging times? What does that look like for you, Gab? For me, it's connecting with other people who may be experiencing things similarly, like my fellow business owners, creators, and people. Um, Last year when our trade shows kept getting canceled, I reached out in the summer to all the people I would see at the specific trade shows. Mm. Can we Zoom? Can we all talk about what we're doing in different areas? And everyone started emailing and writing. And um, I do think connecting with other people and remembering you're not the only one having issues and finding, you know, different solutions and or just input and support. You know, uh, it's hard to be isolated and the businesses are very isolating, especially now with everything virtual, you know, you're can literally run a business from your couch on a laptop. That's not, doesn't feel like community a lot of the time, um, you know, but there's social media and these other ways to connect, which are amazing. But I'm a big fan of picking up the phone and having a conversation saying, can we go for a virtual walk and share with me where you're at? And um, that is, it's like a reality check, right? And it's a support network. It's like group therapy when you say, well, what did you do with this? And how did that work? Mm -hmm. And I think the groups that like joining the groups that um, Coastal Enterprises and Island Institute um, put it, put on over in COVID were things I would have never done in the normal world because I wouldn't have been able to go to them that often. So I think there's a lot of online resources to connect with people for specific issues and then um, finding community. I think that's probably a, a simple way of saying it's finding community and, and reaching out because suffering and mm -hmm. silence solo is, for me, that's never good. Nothing good comes. Yeah. Out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another question. Can you talk a little bit about your partnership with Creative Work Systems? Sure. Okay. This is how much time do we have? Okay. I want to make sure I don't talk too much. Um, when I got that wood from the coffin factory back in the early days, and I was driving around with this trunk full of blocks of wood, and I thought, well, how am I going to turn those into something? Well, I got pulled over for speeding and the guy who pulled me over, this is my hometown. He was my softball coach when I was in fifth grade, um, Mike Sullivan. And he said, he's like, you got to slow down. I said, I know, I know. And he said, what are you up to? And I told him and he said, let me see the wood. So I showed him the wood and he said, I'll take it. So he took it and he said, I work with these guys. They're, they live in this house and they do this woodworking. He brought them back to me 
perfectly shaped for the display. And I said, well, who are these guys? He said, and that was in the 90s, they call them sheltered workshops. They're for um, people who aren't you know, easily employed. They have different physical and developmental challenges. So he said, these are sheltered workshops. So I kept finding them. When I moved to Maine, I found creative work systems and I found community partners. And community partners brought folks in to label the products and put them in gift sets. And creative work systems made our displays. So for about 15 years, we partnered with both those organizations um, until we couldn't anymore for different logistical reasons. But it was a big part of, of coming to work and feeling connected to community. There it is again, mm -hmm. right? And like oh, there wow. was that was meaningful and that helped bring, you know, Mad Gabs into their world and bring folks into our world. And it felt like they were very much a part of the family for a long, long time. So that was super important for many, many years. That's interesting. I didn't know about that. That's a great resource. Thank you. Yeah, they're still there too. And they do lots of amazing work. And when we got that QVC order, Goodwill Industries also had a lot of new Americans and this was in 97. Um, so there weren't as many new Americans in Maine back then. And we had a lot of folks who English, they didn't speak any English, but we could show them how to label and shrink wrap. And so we had all these stations. So there's, again, Maine has so many resources for, for business that are really accessible um, at all levels. So I really can't, can't say that enough. Thank you, Gab. I just want to take a moment. We can all in our living rooms and art studios give Gab a round of applause and say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, and a big thank you and shout out to our sponsors, Ethos, Summer Main Properties, First National Bank, and Bangor Savings Bank. Don't forget to visit the Creative Economy Hub on the Island Institute page and the Artists and Makers Week page as well for upcoming events, including tomorrow's Office Hour with Hannah Richards. It's a continuation of learning about Instagram. And if you missed her um, Instagram presentation, that will also be showing up on, on our recording section. And there's still lots of time today to finish your arrangement for daily art prompt and check out the daily art voices, which can be found there as well. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, we hope you have a great day and we hope to see you again soon.